Um, today, we're very happy, uh, happy to have uh, Clarice uh, Aiello will be our uh, as our speaker. Um, and uh, speaking from Hawaii, of all things, I, I felt bad already that she's now at UCLA and can look at the wonderful sunsets, but it's even better because she can look at different angles. But um, uh, uh, Clara, uh, Clarice actually got her uh, degree from uh, Cambridge uh, looking at photonics of uh, quantum dots, uh, then moved to uh, MIT where she worked with uh, Paola uh, Capillero uh, on looking at NV centers and how you can make qubits and diamond and play with uh, that, which has uh, turned out to be a, a really uh, productive kind of uh, field of enterprise with quantum networks and the like. Um, currently, she uh, is starting as assistant professor at UCLA, uh, and there she's using her uh, knowledge of things nanoscale to look at biosensors for the living world. And so she's going to uh, tell us about that, that today. Thanks. Awesome, hello everybody from Hawaii. <laughs> it's my last day of holidays here in Hawaii. I don't think I've ever been uh, this relaxed to give a talk. So thanks for coming. Uh, can you hear me? All right, see my slides. Awesome, so uh, Robert is going to be relaying questions from the audience for me. So please uh, leave your questions in the chat button. So I like to call myself a quantum engineer. So this means that I build apparatuses to study and control things that are so small and so well protected from their environment that they're better described by the laws of quantum mechanics as opposed to the laws of classical mechanics that rule everything big around us. So people get a little bit surprised when I say that I study things that seem to be uh, happening inside birds, inside butterflies. So before I explain where I'm going, I really need to tell you where I come from. So we're going to start by talking about uh, quantum mechanics and the field of technological quantum sensing. And by the end of the hour, we will have talked about things of biological relevance, such as organismal migration, how our cells react to oxidation stress, to radiation. And I think I will have convince you a little bit, hopefully, that uh, I'm convinced that we can learn with nature how to build better technologies. And that's because I'm a quantum engineer who's interested in how quantum physics informs biology at the nanoscale. So I usually start my talks by saying that uh, I think humankind is sort of obsessed with measuring things better because this may mean that we understand them better. So we might think about, for example, measuring better frequencies or better time units. This is a atomic clock that sits at NIST and it measures using atomic transitions very precisely what a, a second is. We can think about measuring better frequency, better magnetic fields so that the image of your baby is better resolved. And yes, this is the magnetic resonance image of a baby inside the mother's belly. Or we can think about measuring better accelerations with those tiny little accelerometers so that your gaming experience is enhanced. Those tiny little accelerometers are now ubiquitous in all our handheld devices. But the question that I ask is, what happens? if the quantity that you want to measure is very, very small. Or worse, what happens if the object causing the quantity to be measured is very, very small? I'm going to argue that in this case, you need a tiny little sensor that can measure tiny little things. If the sensor is tiny, let's make it very tiny. Let's make it quantum. For reasons that I won't have time to totally explain, um, you can mathematically prove that if you use a quantum object as a sensor, your measurement is improved. In other words, the sensor quantumness enhances the measurement. In my past, uh, as Robert mentioned, I worked with a technological quantum sensor and I will start talking about the sensor. This is not my main topic for today, but I'm actually going to use it to draw comparisons with the sensors that I really care about these days. So uh, let me talk to you a little bit about this technological quantum sensor, a quantum enhanced sensor that could, for example, be put to measure very tiny magnetic fields. So this is the promise that a spin in diamond can be put to use as a magnetic uh, sensor. So the particular uh, spin in diamond, many of you in this audience, I'm sure you have heard about it. Um, it arose from a uh, crystalline defect in the diamond lattice. This crystalline defect 
uh, was is part of a family called a, 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 a the family of color centers, which are responsible for the very nice colors of those diamonds that you see at the bottom of the slide. And uh, those crystalline defects are called color centers for the reason that when light of an appropriate frequency is shown upon them, they absorb this light, they get excited, and then they de-excite emitting light. And uh, this is sort of what you see there, right? So the, the, this type of crystal defect absorb light and fluoresces. The particular defect that I work with, of course, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, is the nitrogen vacancy center. So it arises naturally, but it can also uh, be engineered and uh, it takes place when a missing carbon atom, a vacancy sits nearby to a nitrogen atom, which is the most commonly occurring uh, substitutional impurity in the diamond lattice. When those two things come together, there's like a, a small electronic mess, right? So they're unpaired electrons um, from the, 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 the carbons close to the vacancy, the nitrogen might be contributing to the next electrons, there might be extra charges from the environments that pop up. But something very interesting happens as you start calculating the quantum mechanical energy levels of this electronic mass. And it turns out that the quantum mechanical energy levels of this electronic uh, mass really looks like the um, energy levels of a single electronic spin one. Okay? Uh, it doesn't really matter that it's a spin one for the experts in the audience because uh, you can single out two of the uh, magnetic sublevels out of the three and make an effective qubit, an effective spin qubit, if you will, out of it. And the way that we find those uh, defects and, and play with them in the lab is sort of a, a relatively simple. It happens at room temperature, no need for vacuum chambers or, or anything. So what you do is you put your diamond slab on top of a moving stage. And again, it doesn't need to be People can engineer good diamonds, but in principle, you can use crappy diamonds. The very first diamond that we worked with was a, a discard from a jeweler. So you put your diamond on top of a moving stage and you move it around at the same time that you shine light, in this case, green laser onto it. It doesn't need to be a laser, but uh, it's more efficient and more convenient to use a laser in the lab. And the idea is that as you're moving this diamonds lab around, the moment that this laser hits your sample on top of one of those uh, tra effective trapped electrons, the defect is going to absorb light, get excited, and then fluoresce, and this fluorescence we can collect. And this is what it looks like at increasing zooms. And to this bottom right picture there, you see a blob, and that's uh, in fact a very interesting blob because it's the fluorescent signature of one single electronic spin. So um, you might have heard of magnetic uh, resonance techniques where you need a gazillion spins to get an appreciable, uh, a significant electronic signal. Here, in contrast, you have the fluorescent signature of one single spin. And that's quite remarkable and quite interesting to play with in the lab. However, the, 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 everything gets a little bit better because this defect crystalline defect in diamond has the super convenient property that um, it uh, has something that is called fluorescence dependent uh, 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 quantum state readout. This means that just by looking at how strongly this blob is emitting light, we can actually infer if the spin state is up or down. So just by looking at fluorescence intensity, you can actually infer the quantum state of a spin. So Again, super convenient. But this is what I promised, that you could put it to use as a very sensitive magnetometer. And here's how this works. You have two different uh, spin energy levels that I call 0 and 1. So in this y-axis, it's energy that can be understood as spin up or spin down, say. Turns out that the state 0, uh, those two spins are uh, the, the, their resonance is on the microwave range. It's about three gigahertz. And it turns out that the state zero is insensitive to magnetic fields. That is, uh, if the diamond is immersed into a magnetic field, state zero will not care. Whereas state one 
is sensitive to magnetic fields in that if there is a magnetic field, state one will be promoted to a tiny, uh, another energy level by a shift that I call here delta. And many of you might remember from your classes that given uh, the Zeeman interaction, this delta is proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field. So if you've been sleeping, this is the, the right time to, to, to wake up because what I'm going to tell now, it's not usually told in this way. And I actually <laughs> think it's important because this underlies 95% of the field known as quantum sensing. The problem of measuring a magnetic field is actually mapped onto the problem of being able to measure a detuning delta from a known resonance, from a known energy difference in the absence of a magnetic field. So the Nitrogen Vacancy Center can convey information about the magnetic field because the experimenter can has methods to measure detunings from known energy differences. In fact, this is a signal processing uh, problem that has uh, had solutions for many, many decades. And this is how, again, 95% of quantum sensing works. There is a certain energy difference, a certain resonance that shifts in the presence of the quantity that we want to measure, temperature, uh, electric fields. And we can measure that quantity because we know how that quantity uh, influences this energy shift. And the experimenter knows how to measure such Detunings. And this underlies uh, this field of quantum sensing. But many of you in this audience may know that this is only valid. This sensor can only yield quantum enhanced uh, information while it's well described by the laws of quantum mechanics, while the spin is, uh, it can sustain coherent superpositions. And for the NV center in crappy, uh, naturally occurring diamonds, coherence times, in this case, T3 star, uh, is about two microseconds at room temperature and in bulk, which again, is quite remarkable. People are, are now developing better materials to do this, but even naturally occurring materials uh, can have a nitrogen vacancy uh, spin coherence times of about two microseconds. So again, it, it's all a, uh, signal processing problem, right? So you have a signal that you can take as a function of time. And the longer you can keep the signal going, right? The, 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 the longer you can keep acquiring the signal from this quantum sensor, when you Fourier transform it, the, the, the better your spectral resolution. So there are ways to actually control and I'm sure many of you are familiar with that too, to control uh, the spin to extend this coherence time so that we can actually work with this as a sensor for longer and longer again in a signal processing way, if you will, right? Um, and this has been known for many decades that qubits sustained in matter can be controlled by electromagnetic fields and parenthesis. A qubit sustained by electromagnetic fields by photons, for example, can be con con controlled via matter. So there's a, a very nice correspondence there. But um, I would like to show you in what's probably going to be the, the most technical slide in my talk, uh, one example of such a spin control experiment, how we can give kicks, you know, like as if you were giving kicks to, to, to a swing so that you can keep the swing going. So we're going to give electromagnetic kicks to this uh, nitrogen vacancy center so that it can keep on going as a quantum sensor for longer and longer so that we can have better and better measurements. But before I go to this slide, don't forget about um, this uh, the, the big picture. This is a picture from my thesis advisor actually that I still use. Uh, the idea is to have a tiny little sensor that can be brought in close proximity to a tiny little sample so that we can actually measure tiny magnetic fields produced by this sample. So let me give you an example of just one such spin control experiment. Okay. So those electromagnetic kicks that I, again, in my past at MIT, I applied to those nitrogen vacancy centers. Um, has a name, okay? This particular electromagnetic sequence is called the rotary echo sequence. And it's shown in nuclear magnetic jargon to the right, uh, to the top right 
plot of my slide. Here's what this means. This means that the, the diamond slab is immersed into a magnetic field that we want to measure. And then what we do is we apply a microwave field continuously onto this diamond tuned to the undisturbed resonance of about three gigahertz between the energy of, of spin up and spin down. This microwave is continuous, so it's always on, but at particular times, at particular intervals, we actually phase flip this microwave. Okay? Uh, and this actually, the, 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 the timing of the shift is going to be important. I won't have time to explain, but this uh, pulse sequence is known as a rotary echo. It's been known in nuclear magnetic resonance for, again, more than half a century. And it's known to correct for driving field, for in this case, microwave imperfections. But it's also known not to correct for detunings from resonance. If you remember my last slide, detunings from resonance is exactly what we want to measure because it's going to, to give us information about the magnetic field. Okay. So uh, if you apply the sequence of uh, always on microwaves with phase shifts, uh, we get this particular signal from the nitrogen vacancy center. This signal is just uh, normalized fluorescence intensity. This is normalized fluorescence intensity emitted by the nitrogen vacancy center as a function of the time during which we apply this uh, particular coherent control sequence. Okay, so uh, again, if you remember, the nitrogen vacancy center emits different amounts of, of uh, fluorescence if the spin is up or the spin is down. This means that if you're not on the top of your signal, your spin is, say, up. If you're at the bottom, your spin is, say, down. And anything in between, uh, you have a coherent superposition of up and down. For those of you who remember uh, what that is, uh, this is just a um, modulated rubby fringe experiment. And we can use a technique called average Hamiltonian theory to it's sort of uh, 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 estimate uh, how the signal depends on this tiny little delta, this uh, 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 detuning that we want to measure. And using this complicated formula, if we Fourier transform the signal, we get something that looks like a, a, a spectrum. I'm not telling you how uh, to read this spectrum, but uh, we can identify frequencies, identify detunings, and in this sense, identify the magnetic fields that correspond to those detunings. And in this case, the nitrogen vacancy center is, is feeling th three small magnetic fields, the smallest one, which is about one tenth of the magnetic field of the Earth. Okay. So again, don't forget the big picture, tiny sensor that can be brought in proximity to a tiny sample to read tiny quantities in a quantum enhanced way. Okay. So again, there's a reason why I talked to you about this NV Center, because I wanted to make sure that you realize that I've just talked to you about a quantum enhanced sensor that is active at room temperature and in noisy environments, in the noisy environment of the diamond lattice, in the noisy environment of uh, the, the sample that it wants to measure. I see that there are some uh, raised hands there. So um, before I make a tiny little pause, I would like to, to, to leave you with a question. Okay, and this, the answer to this question is actually going to help my, my, the second part of my talk, which is what I really want to talk about. So this is a uh, question that I, I, I sometimes get right so here's the deal i just talked to you about this sensor that works at room temperature the energy difference between the two states of the sensor is about three gigahertz if um i ask you to google thermal energies say kbt at room temperature in gigahertz units you would find out that uh, thermal energies uh, at room temperature in gigahertz units is about 6,000 gigahertz, right? So here's what I just told you. I just told you that a tiny little sensor that has a three gigahertz energy difference 
right? It's immersed in this 6,000 gigahertz thermal, thermal bath. So the first thing that, that I get asked is, doesn't this thermalize? How is that quantum even, right? So does this make sense that this stuff is quantum at room temperature immersed in this thermal bath? And before uh, I discuss if, if it is a paradox or if it's not a paradox, so it's not a paradox. I just want to make sure um, uh, that, that people can ask questions before I, I go to the second part of my talk, which is really what I want to talk about. Uh, hi, this is Bob Westervelt just stepping in. Uh, the way the software works, to ask a question, you need to go into the chat and then type in the, in the chat the question and put your name or anonymous on the top. And then I'll take a look and I'll ask uh, Clarice officially what the question is. Thanks. So shall I continue for the time being, Bob? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So the fact that this, the answer to the question that you had 30 seconds to think about is, uh, no, it's not a paradox that this three gigahertz sensor is immersed in a 6,000 gigahertz thermal bath. So uh, this quantum sensor, again, does thermalize, right? And the idea here is that it can only act as a quantum sensor before it thermalizes, right? It can only yield quantum enhanced information before those coherence times, before it thermalizes with the environment, before uh, thermodynamics kicks in. So it's not a paradox. We can only work with this as a quantum sensor before thermalization. And many, many times, those times before thermalization is all that we need to read out, in this case, tiny magnetic fields. Okay, so gear shift, complete gear shift. Um, not complete gear shift, you're going to see why, right? So up to, to, to about five years ago, th this, as you see, was the type of sensors that I was used to dealing with, all humankind made, right? But at some time, at some point I realized that many uh, nature-made sensors outperformed humankind-made sensors in crazy, crazy ways. So I would like to talk to you for the reminder of my time about a magnetic sensor in nature that I'm going to argue works very similarly to the quantum sensor in diamond that I just told you about. Okay. So I, I hope I got all the letters correct, the, the acronyms correct for the seminar title. So I would like to talk to you about quantum sensors that putatively occur in nature. But in order to do this, we're going to have to talk about biology at the nanoscale, namely the chemistry. So it's known again for many decades in a field of chemistry called radical chemistry that magnetic fields can alter the final products of uh, certain chemical reactions that depend on spin, okay? So again, in test tube chemistry, there is no doubt that uh, this is what happens. So in very simple terms, here's what happens. So there's a chemical reaction happening and at some point the chemical reaction comes to a crossroads. And at that point, the chemical reaction actually looks to, or if you will, measures the electronic spin of a particular electron. If this spin is measured to be up, the chemical reaction continues through one path. If the spin is measured to be down, the chemical reaction continues through another path. Importantly, the final products of those two chemical pathways are macroscopically different. So a finicky quantum spin property might actually have big time macroscopic consequences on the fate of chemical reactions. The second thing you need to know is that in the presence of uh, a magnetic field, this particular spin that we care about might interact with this magnetic field in a way that is indistinguishable from uh, the quantum sensing that I just described to you. Uh, with the NV center. Okay? This means that in the presence of a magnetic field, this particular spin will sense the field 
which is another way of saying that magnetic fields might actually alter the probability of finding the spin up or down so that a magnetic field might actually also alter the probability that the up pathway is taken or the down pathway is taken. So a brief interaction with a magnetic field before coherence times might actually have macroscopic consequences and at much longer time scales because everything um, happens downstream. Okay. Um, this is the zeroth order of what I wanted to explain to you. Uh, you can ask me for details if we have time later on, but the chemical reactions that depend on spin that I actually care about uh, actually involve two spins, okay? Two electron spins that interact, not one. And the idea being that uh, if the spins are measured to be in a singlet state, the chemical reaction continues to one path. If the spins are measured to be in a triplet state, pointing in the same direction, the chemical reaction continues through another pathway. Okay. But uh, if we have time, we can talk about the details. But the idea is the same. Spin states in test tube chemistry, there is no doubt that they play big roles in chemical reactions. This, again, has been demonstrated at room temperature in solution in the gas phase in the solid state and for magnetic fields as small as the magnetic field of the Earth, which is weaker than the magnetic field that you sense when you bring your cell phone close to your face. Okay. Okay, so that's the chemistry. So here's how biology enters into play. Again, I, I mean, beautiful Hawaii here, surrounded by birds. I really don't care about birds, but birds have the very big advantage of having brought this conversation from chemistry to biology. So birds, again, without a doubt, have been known to uh, uh, migrate uh, navigate when they migrate north south. It's been no it's known that at least as a partial cue that they do use the tiny magnetic field of the Earth to do so. Okay, again, magnetic field of the Earth is smaller than the magnetic field that you sense when you put your cell phone close to your face by orders of magnitude. So how might they be doing this? In the end of the seventies, some brave theoretical biophysicists made this. Crazy hypothesis at that time. Here's what they hypothesized. Well, were the same type of spin dependent chemical reaction being active, say, inside a bird? Birds and other organisms in general would be able to sense magnetic fields to the extent that they would be able to sense the different physiological concentrations of products coming from those different branches of chemical reactions that depend actually on the magnetic field. At that point, that hypothesis was outrageous, right? How can uh, a quantum process be happening at room temperature and for long enough that it can actually actuate on something? And one of the ideas that has not been proved or refuted yet, right, is that maybe birds would actually, when they change their head's direction. Maybe there would be some like photosensitivity modulation on, on something in their eyes that th they would actually see brighter or, or, or darker lines that would maybe guide them to go in one direction or the other. Again, this at the bird lens scale is just a hypothesis. But uh, experimental biophysicists started looking for uh, proteins that could sustain such spin-dependent chemical reaction. And at that time, the only animal, because birds, protein that was known to sustain spin-dependent chemical reactions was a flavoprotein uh, that occurs in the retina of birds, in the antennas of um, uh, uh, migrating butterflies. And this flavoprotein is called cryptochrome. Uh, I would like to let you know that actually cryptochrome is present in all our cells in our body because it also has circadian rhythm regulation uh, functions, right? So it turns out that uh, cryptochrome is super widespread 
throughout the tree of life. All those organisms that you see there uh, express cryptochrome from the very simple to the very complex, and the organisms boxed in red are organisms for which there is macroscopic uh, experimental evidence that cryptochrome is somehow involved with magnetosensing. And yes, humans are right there. And again, uh, throughout almost 40 years of experimental research, there's really a lot of evidence for cryptochrome-based magnetosensing, but unfortunately at very disconnected land scales. Okay, we have evidence for cryptochrome-based magnetosensing at the chemical land scales for test tube chemistry that you see in the left of my slide, and evidence, consistent evidence, correlative evidence for that uh, in, in for big stuff for experiments with birds in in thousands of cells. So let me go over this evidence, right? That is disconnected in land scale, but mostly they're consistent with each other. So for example, to the left of my screen, uh, you have a part of the evidence that cryptochrome uh, in solution in test tube chemistry is magnetosensitive in a way that really looks like what's happening with the Nitrogen Vacancy Center in Diamond that I talked about. Uh, about 20 minutes ago. For example, and this is the top left plot, researchers took uh, cryptochrome in solution and they um, plotted, they, 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 they collected the fluorescence of the cryptochrome as a function of the time during which uh, you shone a laser. So cryptochrome is a, a flavoprotein the, the flavin is a, a chromophore, that is, it's a fluorescence protein. So if you excite uh, that chromophore, it gets excited and then emits fluorescence. So the researchers uh, 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 collected the fluorescence as a function of the time during which you excited that protein with the appropriate laser light. The first thing that you see is that this fluorescence is going down. This means that you're bleaching, you're killing this chromophore, your laser is killing the chromophore. However, as the researchers post a tiny magnetic field on and off, and this is not an artifact, it has been tried with different magnetic field profiles and, and intensities. The researchers, as you see in the inset, see a little bit of a modulation of the fluorescence intensity. Okay? This means that by varying the magnetic field, the fluorescence that the protein emits is different. Again, which is in one-to-one -one correspondence with what is seen with the nitrogen vacancy center. Just by looking at how strongly that blob in the diamond was emitting light, you could infer if the spin was up or down. Here, just by looking at how much light is being emitted by the protein, you can actually infer if the chemical reaction continued through the singlet branch or the triplet branch. So that's actually a very convenient way of reading out the spin states in this protein. So for those of you who have heard this before, uh, you can actually do optically detected magnetic resonance in this protein as well. There's also evidence it's not complete, but I tend to to believe the evidence or the order of magnitude of the evidence that says that um, the, the coherence times of the electrons uh, in cryptochrome at room temperature for cryptochrome in solution uh, is about one microsecond. Again, on par with the two microseconds that I cited for naturally occurring diamond. And all of this indicates without a doubt that cryptochrome in solution behaves as bona fide, as a bona fide quantum sensor. The electron spins inside cryptochrome interact with magnetic fields exactly in the same way that the nitrogen vacancy center does. Except that, again, the next level of the evidence comes from birds and flies, right? So for example, those are very beautiful, very hard experiments. When birds migrate, people catch like 20 birds, put them in cages, mess up with the magnetic fields and see that they want to go out uh, through different directions depending on the magnetic field. Um, Flies. Flies, as far as we know, they don't migrate, but I have no idea how they do this. It's like more complicated than like quantum field theory. They can be trained 
to find food based on the presence of magnetic fields. Okay, I don't know how they do this. But then the researchers uh, knock out, remove the cryptochrome gene from the flies, and the flies are back to finding food given the presence of magnetic fields. Okay, in a, it, 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 it's, so sorry. Flies can find food if there's a magnetic field. They knock out the, the cryptochrome gene, they can no longer find food. And then in a further experiment, the, the experimentalists put back human cryptochrome in fly the flies, and they're back to finding food in the presence of a magnetic field. Uh, all this is consistent, low-tech evidence that there's a quantum phenomenon as confirmed by test tube chemistry going on in cryptochrome inside those organisms, except that it's, it's very hard right, to go from proteins to whole organisms. So here's an idea, and that's what we're starting to do in uh, our lab at UCLA. We want to bridge those two land scales. So we actually want to start throwing quantum technology at, say, single cells. We want to start to study and observe. It's either to establish or refute, like whether, say, in a single cell, um, the, the electron spins involved, for example, in those chemical reactions in cryptochrome, whether they might be quantum. This means that we want, we're want we developing glorified microscopes with uh, coils. Okay, this is not my microscope. This is the microscope that I worked with when I was a postdoc. Our microscopes are not ready yet. But the idea is that we want to start doing the same type of spin control that we did with the NV Center in Diamond, but cutting out the middleman, forget about the NV center in diamond. We want to start addressing those quantum mechanical degrees of freedom in biology as if they were, because they are bona fide quantum sensors. Right. So um, this work is within a field called quantum biology, whose bottleneck is really the lack of high-tech quantum instrumentation to deal with spins in biology. So when I say that I, we're building microscope, it doesn't look like the microscope to the right, right? To the left. It looks like the stuff to the right. Again, this is a picture that I got from the internet. It's a, a big optical table uh, with lasers uh, surrounded by electronics. And it's just that our samples are biological samples. To a physicist, I would describe this as light matter interactions, where matter is biomatter. So uh, right now, right, the, 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 there's a cycle of low-tech correlative evidence that magnetic fields uh, are messing up with physiology in a way that is consistent with the spin phenomenon under the hood. And we need to break clean of this low-tech experiments, right? We need to start throwing quantum technology onto those phenomena in biology. Something that is very cool is that the experimental approach, differently from many uh, experiments in biophysics, is driven by mathematical models. So uh, I won't have time to, to, to explain, but um, using, for example, for, for cryptochrome, right, uh, we can use the photophysics, the known photophysics parameters of the flavin, the, the, the chromophore in cryptochrome, and we can start modeling the, the spins using regular quantum techniques, say open quantum systems. And for reasons that I won't have time to explain, the minimal uh, model that you need to use to model this is has to do with uh, three spins. Okay, Again, I mentioned that there were two spins that defined the fate of a chemical reaction. Uh, those two spins, they um, don't. Uh, this is the min I'm describing the minimal Hamiltonian. Okay, those two spins, they start uh, in a singlet state, but otherwise they don't need to have any interaction among themselves. This spin is free, and this spin is actually uh, strongly hyperfine coupled to an extra uh, nuclear spin nearby. Okay, so with this minimal model, that there, I mean, that that I I can solve. Uh, I mean, there are more complex models that people who do theory, they, they, they include many more nuclear spins and stuff. But even with this very simple 
model, you can start uh, actually making predictions. Okay. So I would like to, for, for example, share with you some of the predictions that we made. We're not the first people to have made those predictions, but we made those two in a slightly different way. So I would like you to look at the top right um, plot that I showed to you there. This is the predicted magnetosensitivity of cryptochrome in this case, okay, as a function of an external field strength for proteins tumbling in solution. Okay, I'm dying to take this curve experimentally. So here's what you see again, this simulated magnetosensitivity, how much a uh, tiny change in an external magnetic field might actually influence that each chemical pathway is taken. This is what I understand by magnetosensitivity. What you see there is that, first of all, this curve is uh, not monotonic in magnetic field. It goes up and down. And it turns out that about 10 times the magnetic field of the Earth at about 600 microtesla, the magnetosensitivity is very diminished. Actually, this is well understood. And this has to do with the strengths of, of hyperfine interactions. and all those, at least all that I know, all those spin-dependent chemical reactions that I talked to you about, they are only sensitive to low magnetic fields. This means that if you put the magnetosensitive proteins inside a magnetic resonance machine with its five Tesla magnet, the five Tesla magnet changing slightly will not alter the chemical reaction yields. However, the type of magnetic fields that actually matter here for this type of chemical reactions is on the order of the Earth, on the order of that produced by your cell phone. So this is the very first thing that you see. It's not monotonic, magnetosensitivity goes up and down for a very uh, well understood reason. The second thing I would like you to, to, to pay attention to is the fact that it, this magnetosensitivity peaks very close to the magnetic field of the Earth which might be a coincidence, or it might be that there has, has been some evolutionary pressure so that the, the sensor works better under the magnetic field that, that it was meant to work under, right? If birds migrate using this. We, we are instrument builders. We don't think we can tell the difference, but we think that people who do directed evolution of proteins can help us distinguish if it's a coincidence or if it, there has been some evolutionary pressure. If there has been some evolutionary pressure, I mean, maybe we could learn with nature, right? If we, we want to be sensitive to a narrow band of magnetic fields, maybe we should start investigating what, how to build this sort of very finely tuned magnetic field sensors. But again, I'm super excited because my talk would be so much poorer if it was only about birds. It's not. There's no, now, again, low-tech correlative evidence that the same type of spin-dependent chemical reaction might be behind many, many super relevant biological phenomena, okay? From the regulation of the production of reactive oxygen species, um, the, product, the, the, the regulation of cellular respiration rates, cellular acidification rates, cellular glycolysis rates, how much uh, stem cell in planaria uh, regenerate, how much DNA uh, gets uh, repaired in bacteria. Um, the autofluorescence of cells, possibly due to uh, flavoproteins in mitochondria, seems to be uh, magnetic field sensitive in a way that is consistent with the spin model under the hood. Again, it goes way beyond cryptochrome. Uh, I mean, it's not only cryptochrome, it's not only for migration. And the the picture that actually uh, makes people make a step and to engage with me is usually this picture here at the bottom of the slide that I have the authorization to share with you. So I have a friend who is a bona fide precision measurement physicist. So what he does for a living is he builds hypomagnetic chambers, you know, and then he shoves ultra cold atoms experiments inside. And uh, his hypomagnetic chambers, uh, 
it can have like a noise level of about one nanotesla. Again, magnetic field of the Earth is 50 microtesla. You see in, in his chamber, we get uh, a, a noise level of about one nanotesla. He started hearing things about, oh, magnetic field effects in biology and stuff. So he decided, and this has been repeated now in two more labs, one a physics lab and the other one a bio lab and with controls, okay? So what he did was he grew uh, tadpoles for two days because that was as long as he could go without asking for a bio permit inside one of those uh, uh, chambers with only this nano tesla uh, field. I mean, he made controls with the same hypermagnetic chambers with a mimicked magnetic field of the earth and the tadpoles were okay. But when the tadpoles were grown only under this nano tesla field, the result after two days, as you can see there, is that about 30% of the tadpoles are macroscopically deformed and not viable, right? Let, let, let's think about what I just told you. I told you that, well, we're not even putting a magnetic field. We're just taking out a tiny DC magnetic field, magnetic field of the Earth, and we're making big changes to like how organisms evolve, right? If this sensing this interaction with the magnetic field uh, were due to some sort of big magnetite inside the, 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 the tadpoles, the, the chunks, because the, the, the field strengths are so small, the magnetite chunks would have to be huge and such magnetite chun chunks are not known to exist inside tadpoles. And to cut a long story short, everyone's best guess is that this has to do with spins. And uh, actually my best guess is that uh, this has to do with melatonin. There's super rich spin physics in melatonin, and melatonin is what gives the, the tadpoles their color. So again, there's other people who uh, 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 cultured cells uh, under hypomagnetic a few conditions too, and they saw differences in gene expression in epigenetics, like methylation rates and stuff. So this sort of opens up this whole Pandora box, right? So that goes from biology on Earth to like, well, if we want to colonize Mars, what's the magnetic field on Mars? Can we grow lettuce in Mars? Can we reproduce in Mars? From that to something like, can we actually learn how to deterministically tweak those endogenous quantum mechanical degrees of freedom towards, say, therapeutics? Another thing that was recently shown at this low tech data is that weak magnetic fields uh, when put around a, a cell culture actually change the way ion channel, uh, calcium ion channel, uh, ion channels function. Okay? So if this is true that ion channel functioning might be regulated by magnetic field in a way consistent with spins under the hood, well, maybe we can even do like this whole new version of optogenetics, right? Today to do optogenetics, you need to genetically encode things that uh, actually, that proteins that when you shine light onto them, they open and close ion channels. If we learned how to deterministically tweak those quantum mechanical degrees of freedom spins like in biology, we could do like tweaking of ion channels in a non-invasive way, because magnetic fields that penetrate real deep doesn't need any genetic encoding, right? So things like this, and, and for, for real, and I'm almost finishing, right? So I really think that uh, quantum biology, high-tech quantum biology is today where quantum computing was 30 years ago. People were just starting, there was a lot of theory, right? Uh, and people were starting to, to do first gates and stuff. I really think that if we start right now for quantum biology, there's a lot of theory done by theoretical quantum physicists and experiments are mainly done by biologists and chemists. If we start bringing quantum engineers to this field, I think that in 30 years we can have a lot of uh, a burgeoning field, right? That is mainstream. And I, I'm that serious when I say that maybe in 30 years, here's where I want to be. I'm that serious. I, I want to, to be able to get my phone, go to an app and say, well, I want, today I need help with wound healing. And then I click there 
and then my, magne my phone produces the correct magnetic field frequency and strength that I need to do wound healing. So the, the technology is already accessible, but before we get to this crappy technology, there has to be like a lot of quantum research so that we can have the, the code book, right? Because each chemical reaction depends on different magnetic field strengths and uh, frequencies. So we need this nanoscopic spin physics derived code book on how to deterministically tweak each chemical reaction, right? So we're not the only people who are throwing quantum tech onto biology. There's a lot of people thinking about this, but we're definitely probably the first people on earth to be using quantum technologies to, to try to, to deterministically control those endogenous quantum degrees of freedom in biology, right? And uh, I have a dream of, of also bringing this theory, bringing this field to the mainstream via uh, not only developing this quantum instrumentation that looks at biology, but also to, to do uh, some uh, community building and uh, education. Like if you want to have a uh, quantum biology department in 30 years, what do you start, what do you need to start doing now? And that's the other hat that I wear. Uh, I uh, am also director of the UCLA uh, Quantum Biology Center, which we have plenty of money to do community building. We don't have enough money for research, but we have a lot of money to do community building in quantum biology. And we are funded by uh, Kavli Moore, uh, the IDOR uh, foundations and by NSF. Okay. So uh, I would like to, to thank the wonderful, wonderful people in my group. Uh, we have, I'm extremely proud of those folks. First of all, I think we have the most, probably the most diverse group in the whole engineering school. I am extremely proud of them because they, they got the vision of where that is that 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 we're trying to go uh, and they joined a uh, starting group during the pandemic during doing work that many many times goes uncomprehended so i have a incredible incredible gratitude towards those uh, very talented multidisciplinary uh, folks there. Okay, so I'm going to conclude my talk saying what I always say when I finish my talk, which is may the quantum be with you. What are your questions? Okay, well, thank, thank you very much. A very, very interesting talk. Uh, for questions, please uh, type it into the chat, and then I'll be formal and read what you typed into the chat, and then uh, Clarice can answer it. I guess I have a, a question to start out with. And so you're making the anal uh, analogy to be some biomolecule that's uh, magnetic field sensitive and say an NV center. Um, and in, and so is it, uh, if I really, you know, I had the ability to do the Schrodinger equations or whatever solution of the biomolecule. Um, and so you think it would be like something like the electron spin inside the NV center where you have the two uh, split spin states uh, and that vary with magnetic field is sort of the engine that makes this work, or is that so? Uh, in test tube chemistry, for example, uh, how spin state, uh, uh, how spin dependent chemical reactions are active inside cryptochromes or are active to uh, regulate uh, the production of reactive oxygen species, this has been modeled. Okay, so, and we're not modeling the whole molecule. We're, we're modeling uh, very specific spin phenomenon within the molecule, which is of course a, a crappy model, right? Actually, we think that in the future, quantum computers might actually help us model those things better. But the minimal model, for example, for cryptochrome is two electron spins that interact and one of the electron spins is hyperfine coupled to uh, to a nuclear spin nearby. Mm -hmm. This is the basic model. It's uh, two electron spins and a shell of nearby nuclear spins. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is true at least for cryptochrome and for the modeling of the production of reactive oxygen species. So uh, again, in in the chemistry 
language. It's, it's really funny because this has been known in chemistry for decades and they just don't use the same language. It's, it's really the same thing as quantum sensing. Those uh, electron spins are interacting with the external magnetic fields uh, via the coherent superposition of singlet and triplet in the sense that that's bona fide. Yeah. Okay. Quantum sensing. Oh, fantastic. So this way the bumblebees find the flowers. And, um, <laughs> let me look Q&A. Um, here's from Abu Ahmed uh, Saberi. Um, do you study uh, magnetic fields directly on live cells or just the proteins like cryptochrome via blue light? Um, question. We want to do both. Um, our goal is to actually refute or, or, or prove that Crypt, for example, cryptochrome, it doesn't need to be cryptochrome. Cryptochrome is historically the most studied thing because of birds, right? But we want to um, confirm or refute that cryptochrome in vivo is coherent for as long as it's needed to sense, for example, the magnetic field of the earth. But we also want to study proteins uh, by themselves in a very systematic way that is not available in previous uh, experiments. For example, if birds um, really sense the magnetic field of the Earth uh, via cryptochrome, birds actually have an inclination compass that, that has to do with the proteins all being aligned or, or having, they, they shouldn't be tumbling for this particular, for the bird's sense of, of navigation. So what we want to do is, for instance, put the proteins all sticking up in a, in, a, in a slide, deterministically changing the magnetic field direction and see if we see changes in uh, the protein response, if you will, in the, in the optically detected magnetic resonance. So we want to do both in response to the question, but the final goal is to learn if it's possible to actually actuate on cells, on living things, not only cryptochrome, but using those endogenous quantum mechanical degrees of freedom, which seem to be playing a big role, according to the low tech evidence that exists, that has existed for like 50 years. Okay, and uh, uh, another question? Yes, we have some here. Oh, a long question. Let's see, <laughs> Kanadra Singh. Uh, will it be possible to develop quantum biological sensors working at room temperatures, combining spintronics and biology? It keeps going on, trying to integrate them with uh, nanoelectronics, a true quantum materials and biological devices, uh, something like that possible with applications in cancer therapeutics, wound healing, uh, stem cell regeneration, a modifying our, let me, let me just stop at the beginning uh, because it's, it's sort of going off another Yeah, the, 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 I'll, 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 so if you may, if I may, I'll take the question. So the question is, is there an interface between spintronics, nanoelectronics? Let me, give me two minutes to talk to you about something that I couldn't talk about during the talk, which is also okay. fascinating. There's another phenomenon that is the coolest thing that nobody has heard about. It's called chiro-induced spin selectivity. A chiro-induced spin selectivity is a phenomenon first seen in DNA and in peptides and that uh, whose properties are now being explored by materials people who, and chemists who actually build materials that exploit this property. Here's the observation. The observation is that if you push electrons through a chiral molecule, say a DNA helix, right? That was the very first experiment. If you put, push electrons through a, a, a DNA helix at room temperature, right? And if you spin analyze, the electron spins as they're spit out by the molecule on the other end at room temperature because of thermal energies you would expect more or less half of the spins to be up and then half of the spins to be down however many experiments not only in dna but in other chiral materials have now confirmed that you do have an appreciable spin polarization at room temperature. So for example, pushing through DNA, instead of having 50-50 spin up, spin down, you see 40 up, 60 down, depending, you change the material and you go to like 90% spin up, 10% spin down, which is of course 
weird and unexpected. I like to call it nature's own way of doing spin state preparation, right? So I think that this, so this chiral induced spin selectivity uh, has been explored for spintronics. Uh, when, when people wanted to do like uh, spin polarized current and stuff. And I actually think that there's a chance we might be able to use this phenomenon for quantum applications too, right? I, I won't have time to, to talk about this, but uh, yes, beyond what you, what uh, Ganendra mentioned there about nanosensors, right? Uh, quantum sensors that are biological, I think that from what I, I, I explained to you in the talk, the, the thing that is the most compelling is controlling those things for therapeutics. And there's this other thing that we're investigating, this chiral induced spin selectivity that I think is going to blossom when we start trying to use it for quantum information. So yes, I, I think that we can learn with, with biology on how to build better technologies and also use those endogenous quantum degrees of freedom in biology to tweak them, right? For maybe therapeutics, again, in the future. Right now it's completely science fiction, but I think that in 30 years we can get there. Okay, well, well, fantastic. Um, uh, let's see, one. Uh, one last question, uh, Abu, uh, Abu Hamad uh, Saberi, what kind of experimental setting tools do you think to, excuse me, I can't read this, think you need to customize if you would study live cells in media to measure quantum effects? I particularly ask because study of live cells usually needs to be in liquid media, media which also will be affected by magnetic fields. Yes, so this is why I call all the experiments that we're building glorified microscopes with coils. So uh, we're building optical microscopes with coils, a STM microscope with coils. Uh, we want to build a electrophysiology setup with coils and, and you're right, they need to be adapted to perform quantum control and quantum measurements. Okay, so uh, for the control part, it's the coils, right? M miniaturized and macroscopic coils that need to be adjusted into our optical setup. And the other important part is the detection that you need to do optically detected magnetic resonance on those uh, spins. Actually, many proteins, it's not only cryptochrome, many proteins uh, that can sustain spin-dependent chemical re reactions, you, you can do optically detected magnetic resonance onto them. So you need basically to adapt quantum technology, for example, that is used to do optically detected magnetic resonance in NV centers and use those same techniques to, to look at uh, spins in biology. So what we want to do are quantum experiments inside cells. And yes, we are thinking about how to keep cells happy and, and things like this. But it's it's a quantum experiment that works on biology. Okay, well, thanks very much for your talk and for the answering the, the interesting questions. Um, very nice. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Hi, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye -bye.